You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello Book Talk Today family and welcome back to another episode of the Book Talk Today podcast. Today I'm really excited to announce back on the podcast Andrew Graham Dixon to discuss Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel. Andrew came on the podcast at the latter part of last year to discuss Caravaggio and the podcast went so well and was so well received by you I just couldn't wait to have him back on to discuss Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel. In our podcast we discussed the divine nature of Michelangelo's art also the creation of the Sistine Chapel and the process that Michelangelo went through over the four-year period to create it, but also what it meant for art in general and the legacy that the Sistine Chapel has for what art could be and what Michelangelo made art after its creation. I was really excited to have Andrew back on the podcast and it was such a fascinating conversation for art lovers or for anyone who's just interested in the creation of something new and ethereal and the divine nature of art. I hope you enjoy it. Andrew, it's a pleasure to have you back on. Hi there, thank you for having me. Based on our previous podcast, I know we were just briefly discussing it, um, which was very well received on, on Caravaggio, I was very excited to have you uh, back on to discuss uh, Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel. I had the pleasure of visiting it in the mid 2000s, I think, and, and when we visited Rome and I was blown away by it. So I was very interested to read, read your book about it and, and get your thoughts about Michelangelo, his life and, and the Sistine Chapel itself. So before we get into the Sistine Chapel specifically regarding Michelangelo, I think it would be good just to discuss him, his origins and what made him such a leading figure. Sure. Well, I mean, his... His origins. He was born. Um, he was the son of a sort of minor Florentine, sort of fallen on hard times merchant who then became a kind a notary. So his family was from reasonably high original origins, but had fallen on hard times during you know during his generation. Um, and his father was always asking him for money and and never properly realising Michelangelo's letters are full of sort of infuriated references to the Pope. His dad just doesn't realise, you know, in his constant quest for a bit of money for the family, doesn't quite realise the heights to which Michelangelo is climbing. And in a sense, um, you'd have to say that he had, he almost as if he had another father because he was taken under the wing of Lorenzo de' Medici or Lorenzo the Magnificent who was the leading member of the Medici family in Florence. Michelangelo was brought up in Florence and he was taken into his household. He was recognised for the prodigy that he was at a very early age Um, and Lorenzo I believe did things like expose Michelangelo to to Botticelli's drawings which he owned in portfolio and there are There's evidence that some of Michelangelo's later work is influenced by some of those drawings, including Michelangelo's David, actually, uh, which is quite similar to one of the great drawings done by Botticelli for Dante's Inferno, which Lorenzo owned. Um, And it's hard to see how else Michelangelo could have seen such a thing. And he also was exposed to um, this extraordinary sculpture collection, which he made in the gardens um, that the Medici family owned nearby the monastery of San Marco, where uh, there was a... a curator of sculptors, an, an elderly man called Giovanni di Bertoldo, who had studied under Donatello, and is probably the person who, who first interested Michelangelo in sculpture, uh, as opposed to painting. So, so he he's an interesting background, um, never appreciated by his own family, taken on by a very very noble family that did indeed greatly appreciate him, and um, but no one can explain uh, really the nature of his prodigious gifts, <laughs> quite how he had them, how he came by them. You know, some people are just born uh, extraordinary and he seems to have been one of those people. It was interesting because at the beginning of the book, you talk about his desire to preserve uh, the intact aura of his own sufficiency. I think that's what you uh, the, what you said in the book. And you talk about uh, Vasari and Condivi, the two uh, 
biographies that were written about him and, and how they were somewhat uh, opposing to a degree and, and how he actually had influence over them. So how much was it based on what you just said about being in the Medici family and having access to all those drawings and, and people and opportunities and how much of it was that divinely gifted talent that he wanted people to think it was? Well, I think there was there was certainly a degree of, of, of teaching that he later in life um, wanted to conceal because he he was quite keen on the idea that his gifts were purely God-given. You know, Vasari himself, who idolised Michelangelo, called him the divine Michelangelo in recognition of Vasari's own belief that, that Michelangelo's gifts came from God rather than from any tuition or education that he'd received. However, the fact is that despite the rather unconventional nature of Michelangelo's youth, um, you know, and this, this uh, exposure to the court and to the court possessions um, and, and, and retainers like Giovanni di Bertoldo of the Medici family. The fact still remains that, that Michelangelo did receive a conventional apprenticeship painting um, tuition at the hands of Domenico Ghirlandaio, who painted a great series of frescoes for Santa Maria Novella. It's the church right next to the modern train station in Florence. People can go and visit it. And Ghirlandaio, for that chapel, painted a, a wonderful series of scenes of the life of the Virgin, um, all set in modern Florentine dress. So the Virgin becomes a kind of well-to-do, almost Medici-style Florentine noblewoman, you know, giving birth to Jesus in the house of a Florentine, you know, which is really a Florentine palazzo and so on. Michelangelo definitely um, studied there. You know, otherwise, how could this man, who is supposedly only a sculptor, have painted or have even agreed to take on uh, a fresco cycle of the scale of uh, the Sistine Chapel. But um, Vasari published the fact that he had been an apprentice with the Gil and Dio family. And um, he then, uh, Michelangelo then was so displeased by the revelation of this that he, he authorised his own biography to be written by a man called Ascanio Condivi in, in rivalry with Vasari or to replace Vasari's version in which this was roundly denied. And Vasari was so irritated by the fact that Michelangelo had accused him, in a, in a sense, of being a liar, that he, he went round to the Ghirlandaio workshop and, well, he didn't get a photocopy because such things didn't exist, but he got, he, he got a transcript of the original contract and then published some of the details in the second edition of The Lives of the Artists to, just to say, well, no, I'm not a liar. And he really did receive some training, even though he is divine, he was taught. And Michelangelo himself... Um, did prefer the, the, the more mystical types of explanation of his talents, for sure. Um, so while downplaying the practical side, i.e. Gil and Dio did actually teach him and they had a contract, um, he, he, he preferred the idea that he'd got his gifts for sculpture from um, the fact that he was uh, breastfed by a wet nurse. You know, back in those days, people didn't necessarily breastfeed their own children. They sometimes hired other women to breastfeed their children. And, and he was breastfed by the daughter of a stonemason who lived up in the, in the mountains of Carrara, above Florence, which is where they get all the marble from in that time to, to, to make the great sculptures. It's where the marble for the David came from. And, and Michelangelo liked to say that he was... Um, he, 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 said, he actually said he, 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 he drank in uh, stonemason's chisels and um, marble chips through her milk. So it was as if he sort of painfully ingested the materials of his profession as a sculptor, which is always what he, he said he was, first and foremost. He, he didn't like painting. He, he, didn't, he, he didn't value painting, which seems like an odd thing for the creator of the world's most famous painting to say. But he, he, he regarded sculpture as really the the essential, the most serious of the great art forms. I almost think that him downplaying it is almost to make it seem like everything that he created or the Sistine Chapel that he created was greater than if he was just a fresco painter. Because he was a sculptor, for him to create the Sistine Chapel without it being his primary skill is, makes it seem his grandeur to be even greater. Yes, I suppose it's it's like the, uh, it's like the Olympic 100 meet a sprinter just sort of suddenly deciding oh I'll, I'll have a go at doing you know the long distance swimming or something and then he wins the gold medal yeah, I've never trained at it but anyway you know I'm just so good and God's on my side to such an extent that 
it doesn't really matter what I do, I'll win. Yeah, it definitely did feel like that. And and in reference to his spirituality and religion, I know in the book you referenced that he he felt as if his art was his um, his way of of connecting to the divine because he was known as being celibate to a degree and he considered his work and his art to be all that he needed. So what was the role that his somewhat asceticism played in his life in general? Well, he never married. Um, he was, I mean, he was very ascetic. Uh, one thing he did get from his father, which Vasari tells us about, which is sort of peculiar, monastic, slightly to some... <laughs> to some people distasteful, was the fact that his, his father told him, A, never to wear anything on his head, so he never wore a hat, unlike most people, even though he lived his life in Rome, which is not a place not to wear a hat, in my opinion. And um, B, he never washed, or he washed as seldom as he could, because it was said to be bad for your health. Um, it's, it's a sort of hermit who never washes, and Vasari describes once, in a quite grisly fashion, he describes watching Michelangelo during one of the rare occasions when he used to take off his buskins, which are these sort of uh, knee-length tights or socks that they used to wear in those days. And he said that the skin came off them, so it was as if Michelangelo was like a snake shedding his skin. So he was, he was sort of a very peculiar mixture of things, you know, very divine, very inspiring, but also at the level of personal hygiene, it sounds to me like he was a nil out of ten. Yeah, perhaps needed to uh, attend some more social gatherings, perhaps socialised a bit more. He certainly didn't do that. He, he was very much non, not the social type, which is why he didn't like Raphael, because Raphael came in, you know, sw swung into town, you know, the new hit wonder from Urbino, and very young, came, came in, won the approval of the Pope, was given these great frescoes to paint in, in, in the Vatican Library, painted the School of Athens, Parnassus, painted all these classically inspired subjects, really stealing the kind of thing that Michelangelo was doing, and not only stealing them metaphorically, but actually, because Raphael was one of the few people the Pope allowed into the Sistine Chapel halfway through, because halfway through, Michelangelo erected a scaffold. So when he, when he got halfway through, the scaffold only covered half the ceiling. So when he got halfway through, he had to come down, take the scaffolding down and re-erect it so that he could then paint the second half. At which point, if you stood on the floor of the Sistine Chapel, the first half, which he had painted by then, and which had been obscured by the scaffold, you could now see it. So Raphael went in, saw it, and promptly borrowed a whole load of figures for his, some of the figures of the prophets and the Sibyls in particular, for some of his paintings. And not only that, you know, he, he was very, very gifted with um, social graces, and he was very entertaining. The Pope was... Um, you know, enchanted by his company, whereas the Pope admired Michelangelo, but they didn't really speak to each other that much because Michelangelo was always too busy in his ascetic bubble, um, getting on with his work for God. One of, the, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is how much influence the Pope played in the creation of the Sistine Chapel, how much influence he had over the, the figures in there, the story, the triads. Um, how much influence did the Pope actually have? Conventionally, uh, art historians always used to argue that um, such an important commission, because the Sistine Chapel is, after all, you know, the chapel where the conclave to elect each new pope is held. It's this. It's the essential uh, chapel in the Vatican for the celebration of mass. You know, how how could a, a mere artist be allowed to, you know, invent all his subjects um, and and invent his iconography? Um, but the fact is. It, you know, we do know that originally um, what the Pope wanted was something, you know, very, very mundane and straightforward. Um, you know, he wanted a, a small group of allegorical figures, and I think he just wanted a almost an abstract ceiling p painted with, with stars or something like that. And, and um, Michelangelo thought that was a poor thing, in quotes, and uh, offered his own solution, which was this great series from the Genesis cycle, which is partly to be explained by the fact that the lower registers of the chapel had already been painted um, with scenes, uh, for example, from the life of Moses. Uh, and and the, yeah, I think I believe it's the life of Moses and the life of Christ. Um, and, and so the, you know, the upper register, the, the story of Genesis, it, you know, it hadn't been painted. And in a sense, in theological terms, it was an opportunity to complete 
the kind of Christian version of history as told in the Bible by including the, the, very, the very beginnings, um, Genesis and all that. But in terms of how he painted it and the way in which he chose to depict the subjects, A, there aren't that many precedents for it because it's not that frequently depicted. The main precedent is um, to be found in, in a work of art that he certainly knew, which were the two great sets of or the, the two great baptistry doors painted on the theme of um, uh, Genesis by, not painted, sorry, I'll start again. There was certainly a, pre a precedent for it, um, but, but not very many precedents for it. Um, the main one would have been the Doors of Paradise, which is actually the name Michelangelo gave to them, which were created by the early Florentine Renaissance artist called Ghiberti. Spent 30 years over these amazing um, uh, gilded bronze doors, which show all the scenes, and most of the same scenes that Michelangelo painted. But Michelangelo completely reinvented that iconography, which Ghiberti took from other artists and had been more or less stable for a very long time. But there was no precedent, for example, for having God as this astonishing caped, winged figure um, flying through space, which would in fact have huge influence on popular art in the 20th century because it was the inspiration for the Marvel comics. You know, the caped superheroes, they actually come from the figure of God in the Sistine Chapel. It was Michelangelo who invented that way of depicting someone with superhuman powers soaring through space. Um, and and it's to such an extent was it original that... You know, one, we do have an eyewitness account of the Sistine Chapel very early on by a man called Paolo Nocera, who was a bishop. So he's an ecclesiastical, he's a man of the cloth and a bishop. And he, look, he, he looks up at the ceiling and he looks up at the most famous image on the whole ceiling, which is Adam being created by God with their fingertips almost touching as God creates Adam. Uh, and, and he remarked that he didn't have any idea who this old man was flying in the sky. So, so when it was first done, you know, the, the, the iconography was so original and so different from anything anybody had ever seen that even a bishop didn't know what was going on, which would argue to me that Michelangelo surely, surely, surely invented this stuff. And he invented this way of doing it. He seems even to have invented the idea that this is what should be depicted. Sure, he should have had approval. I imagine he couldn't have done it without having to explain himself to some papal advisor or indeed the Pope himself. But, you know, the, the idea that such an advisor or the Pope himself could have suggested these things to Michelangelo is, is beyond possibility in my mind. Did he, did he sketch them before he sort of took them to the, to the actual chapel itself? Did he, how did he actually go about transferring it? Did he, was there any diaries of ideas that, that have been left or is it just, he just did it straight? There are numerous drawings for different parts of the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo was a great draftsman, so there are many drawings, some in the British Museum, for example. And um, the, the standard procedure, I mean, for example, in the case of Raphael, who was working at the same time in um, the Vatican Library, we actually have uh, in the Brera in Milan, there is a huge semicircular drawing for the School of Athens. Amazing drawing, one of the most amazing drawings in the world. It's the same size as the fresco. And if you go and look at it, you'll see that all the figures, the outlines of all the figures have been pricked with a sharp point. And that's, that's because the method was that you, you would um, take your drawing and you would transfer it to the wall. Um, I believe, I'm, you know, I never painted a fresco myself, but I believe you would do that um, in such a way that once the plaster had been laid, you would prick the drawing through and then you had to paint while it was, you know, while the plaster was still wet. So you might well use the same drawing two or three times or many times it, because you can only paint eight hours when the fresco is still wet and then you have to stop and start again. So they call each bit of laid on fresco a giornata in Italian, which means a day's work. So, for example, just as hypothesis, you know, Raphael, if, if you take his big drawing, say he was able to accomplish one sixth of that or one fifth of that or just one figure from it in a day. That's how much of the drawing would be pounced through 
and then transferred. And then he would paint using that drawing as his guide, but he would have to paint directly into the into the fresco. There's no you can't draw on fresco. So that and and that's how Michelangelo worked. But as he got towards the end, I mean it's interesting, and it's interesting that he's you know he started at, he started at the end further away from the altar. Um, so he started with the last. He started at the end, as it were. If it was a film, he he started by, as it were, shooting the last sequence, which was the life of Moses. And only at the end of his painting procedure did he paint, for example, God creating the earth, God creating the oceans, God separating light from darkness. He did those right at right at the end. And if you look at the very very first image in the whole Genesis cycle which is God at the very beginning having you know who is the, God is the word and he will he will separate light and darkness that very very first image right over the altar uh, Michelangelo didn't use I mean he, he will have almost certainly made a drawing but he didn't use the traditional technique there's no outlining of the drawing he just did it free so he did it like free and and almost no one could do that I know you gave reference to it in the book and you said that his style changed during the period from when he started to when he finished because it was a four year period if, if I'm correct. Um, yeah. And you talk about in reference to the four spadrils you say that he developed a style of mannerism and his actual style changed it as the work evolved. Was that the case really then when he transferred from, for instance, putting the drawings up on the fresco and, and doing the, the eight hour shift to then just doing it by freehand? Did his skills improve as the project went on? Immensely. His skills improved immensely, but he planned for that to happen. And that's what's quite interesting, because the way that he worked was he, he could only paint half the ceiling at a time because it was too technologically challenging to fill the entire Sistine Chapel with a single scaffold. So he couldn't fill the whole chapel with a single scaffold. It also would have made the ceremonies that still took place in the chapel impossible to, to, to complete. So he, he, had to, you know, he had to only fill half of the chapel. And he chose to fill the chapel that's nearest the way out and to start that. And if you, if, you, if, you, if you stand with your back to, to where the original exit to the chapel was, it's been moved because of tourism, but the, originally the chapel's exit was at the far end of the chapel, um, as it would be in any cathedral. So, you know, when you enter, you, you're standing at the door and you, the altar is as far away as it can get, and you can only walk towards the altar. So everything that he's painting at the beginning is furthest away from the altar. And in his story, in the way that he's designed the story, the, the nature of the story is that in the beginning there was God and God made the word and God made the world. So you go from that to God creating Adam and you go from that to the fall of man and you go from that to what's going to happen to the children of Adam. Who are they? Well, then you go to the fact that they all betray God and get drunk and they fail and they fall. And then Noah builds the ark and then there's a deluge and humanity is consumed and Noah will be saved. But then Noah gets drunk and then it's the end. That's the story. So if you think of all of the, the nature of the scenes after the fall of man, basically, this is a story of corrupt human decadence. If you go all the st stories before the fall of man, it's all about heaven and God and perfection and the making of Adam, and the making of Eve, and the making of them perfect, and, and they will screw it up. Now, Michelangelo starts his painting at the point where humanity comes into the scene. So in other words, for all of the human parts of the painting of his story, he's the young Michelangelo. He's the first phase Michelangelo. For all of the later ones, as he moves towards God and as he moves towards the altar, He's moving towards the end of his painting process. So he's engineered it so that the very last thing he paints will be God at his most perfect, because then Michelangelo will be at his best. And the very first thing he paints will be all these scenes of human decadence when Michelangelo is at his worst, or at his most immature, or at his least resolved, put it that way. 
So I think he, he was almost programmatically planning. My question was, is did he actually have anyone to help him? Like who helped him? Who, who were the trained individuals that helped him or did he do everything himself? He said he had no assistance. I mean, he certainly had some assistance and he sacked some assistance. It's a bit of a murky area, but if you look at the actual um, way in which he did the painting, Michelangelo was very much um, the opposite of Rubens or the opposite of Vasari, who, who himself, who was a very successful artist as well as, or not, not a very good one, but a very successful artist for the Medici family and employed huge numbers of assistants. Um, Michelangelo doesn't seem to have done that. There are some parts of the Sistine Chapel, um, like the lower register, the, there are some depictions of the ancestors of Christ, which are really probably the most minor depictions of all in the whole Sistine Chapel. And some of those do look a little bit as though perhaps they might have been, uh, you know, done by a different hand. But if you look at the figures of the Sibyls, or if you look at any of the important figures, you know, the figure of Adam uh, in the centre of the ceiling, I mean, the, the, there's almost... He's got a very distinctive personal style, Michelangelo, and the, there's nothing there to suggest. You know, it's, it's, it's not at all like other artists, such as Titian, where you can, you know, you can perhaps see that the landscape was done by a studio assistant. There's nothing like that in Michelangelo. I, I think he, he saw it as his own work. I think it, it was his own work. It was a superhuman effort as his talents developed and, and he planned it in such a way, was that in uh, parallel to his actual religion and asceticism? Because I think in, in the book as well, you talk about how his own journey and how he started. The last thing that he painted was God itself. So did he do that knowing that this process would see him become closer to God as well? I think that idea is very much in his mind. And I think it's, I think it's in his mind at the beginning. If you look at the scene of... Um, Noah building the ark, Noah you know, building this kind of refuge from humanity where he's going to save everyone, but he's not going to save humanity. He's only going to save you know, himself because he's been chosen by God and his wife because he's been chosen by God with her. And they will be the you know, man and woman and you know, he's only going to save them. When you look at that depiction of the ark, it looks remarkably to me like almost a little mini architectural model of the Sistine Chapel. And, and, and I, I sort of think that Michelangelo, because he, he's painting these pictures at a time, you know, which is the early 16th century, when there's a lot of millenarianism about people believing that, you know, maybe the end of the world is nigh. One of the reasons for commissioning the Sistine Chapel and a lot of the other commissions of this period, uh, one of the reasons is that the, the papacy and those around the papacy genuinely think that perhaps the book of Re Revelations is about to come true, that this is the time after the half time that, you know, the, the, that's referred to in the, in, you know, in the words of the book of Revelations and that, the, you know, that the, the Antichrist is about to rise. And, you know, Luca Signorelli, whose uh, depictions of the lives of the, the life of the Antichrist, the coming of the Antichrist, They've just been done in Orvieto. They're a big influence on Michelangelo. They were created about six years before the Sistine Chapel was begun. There's a lot of this in the air. Savonarola, who was the sort of hellfire preacher who took over Florence um, from the Medici in the late 16th in the late 15th century, he had preached hellfire and damnation. And you know these ideas were about. And and I think that Michelangelo perhaps saw himself as somebody you know in this end time rather as Noah was in his own end time. So Noah's Ark becomes the Sistine Chapel, which is Michelangelo's Ark. And there he is right at the top of the boat that is the chapel, painting to God, painting for God, painting the message of God, painting enlightenment, so that, you know, when it comes to the final contest between good and evil, people will come to the Sistine Chapel and they will see and they will believe. And, you know, the new heaven and the new heaven on earth that's predicted in the book of Revelations will come to pass, and Michelangelo's all part of that. I don't think it's, it's, you know, you have to understand that people have a very, very different mindset to ours in that time. And I, and I think that that's, that's part of it. He's, he's, he feels very, very close to God. And he writes poems about, he's one of, as well as, you know, again, we were talking earlier about how he could just sort of be something outside his speciality. He's not even a he's not even a painter, but he paints the Sistine Chapel. He's not even a poet, but his modern reputation in Italian literary circles is as the greatest poet of the Italian 16th century. So, you know, 
But he writes these poems about his devotion to God, sonnets, a lot of them. Um, and and uh, so I think, I think that's very much, very much part of it. And it's very important to him that he wants to depict God uh, at, at, as the very last thing that he does. And, and, and the other thing about it all is, of course, that there are, there are all kinds of details in the Sistine Chapel which we can now appreciate and, 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 and admire because we have reproductive technology. We've got great photographs, but there's a lot of bits of it that you can't necessarily really see um, unless, or you couldn't see in his time, unless you were actually up on the scaffolding. So that in Michelangelo's mind, I believe that a lot of those small details and subtleties are actually just painted for the contemplation of God, because God's the only, well, not person, but God's the only being who will ever see these details. And that's a, that's a Florentine tradition too. Donatello, who Michelangelo greatly admired, made a series of amazing sculptures to be placed very, very high up on, on the cathedral spire, uh, not the spire, the cathedral tower of Florence Cathedral. And those sculptures have got astonishing details of realism and skin texture and all sorts of things that you simply would never know from the ground. I mean, they're not on, they're not on the ground anymore. They're in museums, so we can appreciate them. But if you imagine them put up in the sky, as they originally were, they've got all levels of detail that were surely only made for God. And this goes, it's a medieval tradition medieval cathedral builders did the same thing and, and I think there's a lot of that in the Sistine Chapel. It almost seems like it's more of a personal not sacrifice but a personal gift to the divine rather than for perhaps humans to appreciate especially in relation to the the details like you're talking about because people wouldn't be able to see those details so who is it actually for is it for the people or is it somewhat like a sacrifice in, in a way? An artistic sacrifice, if you want to call it that. I mean, in my opinion, it's quite a punishing object, if you understand it correctly. I mean, in my view, I mean, I spent a long time thinking about how it's meant to be seen and about what it says. And um, the, I, I sometimes believe, think that the structure and the way in which, because it's so often seen in reproduction, we, we don't necessarily think about how it was originally experienced when it was first made in the context of the building for which it was created. And if we return to the to the, to the original configuration of the, of the chapel. If you enter the chapel, if you're a lay person, you're only allowed halfway up anyway. So you can only get halfway to the image of God beginning everything. If you're the Pope, okay, you can, you, you're on the other side. But if you're just an ordinary person like you or me, we, we never get further than halfway. So we can see towards the altar, we can see above the altar the perfection of God separating light and darkness. But if we look up, we then see God creating the moon and the sun, God creating Adam, we then see the fall of man, we look above ourselves, we see the deluge, we then see the scenes of drunkenness, and that's the end. And our destiny is to walk out of the chapel. So we're at the human end. And as we walk out of the chapel, it strikes me that by implication, whatever we do next is the latest thing that happened in the fresco cycle. So you might go outside and buy an ice cream, but you're still in the fresco cycle because you've left God and now you're just in your mundane life buying an ice cream. I don't know, doing something bad, having to go to confession, whatever you might do. But he, he's almost the, the, the fresco cycle physically expels us but it doesn't let us go it expels us from the chapel but we're still in its grip and i think michelangelo's idea is that we will always want in our minds to return to the place we were halfway along which was as far as we ever got but we want to go further we want to go back we want to go to to god because it's it's a it's a cycle that condemns us to a kind of fallen existence whether we're crossing the street getting on a bus we're still in the painting because we're doing the latest thing in this great divine story, however low that may be. And we're being reminded of the immeasurable gulf that separates us from the cosmic majesty of God that we saw in the chapel, which was the beginning of everything. Sometimes, you know, the other day I had a conversation with a physicist about who studies deep, deep space and the origins of all things. And they, and they did say to me that it's, you know, it's peculiar to me to think after studying dark matter and the formation of our universe and the, and the sheer scale of our universe, which is 
you know, our sun is one of two billion, billion, billion suns in 20 billion universes in nine billion. It's just all inconceivable size. And then they have to go out and they have to get on a train and they have to ask for a ticket. And, and you just, it's just very hard to put it together. And I think the, the Sistine Chapel challenges us with, some, with a similar sort of sense of our own tininess in relation to the cosmic scale of God. That's uh, interestingly enough, that's how I felt when I visited. So I was in my early teens. Uh, it must have been 13, 14 when I visited it. And that was distinctly what I remember feeling. Because I thought to myself, wait, one person painted this and it was a person. And then once I started studying it more and reading about it, and then it talks about the book of Genesis and then its relationship to God. And then the whole Adam with God with the finger and is like, is that the transference of consciousness in relation to, to what humans are and human consciousness? And then that got me thinking about how he created this. Is it to basically be a mirror to, to, to civilization and to humans and be like, this is your insufficiency. And then I, I was sort of thinking about that in my early in my early and mid teens, and I thought to myself, "Oh, this is a bit deep." Well, I think I think in a nutshell, I think you've got it. I mean, I think that is that that that's absolutely dead right. Yeah, that that's it. And and that finger that's creating consciousness in Adam, that's another of his inventions. Because in um, in most, well, in all previous depictions of the creation of Adam that I know. God doesn't, he doesn't do this and raise Adam, you know, in that way. He simply does, makes an uplifting gesture and Adam raises himself up from the earth. Um, and Adam, in, in, in Jewish scripture, um, Adam is a Jewish word that means earth. So that's why Adam rises from the earth, because he's made from the earth, he's made from the clay, um, but Michelangelo doesn't do that. It's a much more conceptual, platonic idea. And I think Michelangelo, this finger that God is pointing at Adam, the finger has a precedent. The, the idea of the finger of God creating something or writing something is present in, in, in old Jewish and Christian ideas about the, the creation of the tables of the law. When he writes the Ten Commandments, in, in some accounts, it's as if God has got a laser and it's it, so that the finger is almost like a pen or a, or a laser. I think a laser is maybe a better analogy. And, and in, in modern terms, I, what I would say God is doing is he's not just creating Adam. He's not raising from the earth and he's not just creating it. He's actually programming him. In other words, he's writing a much more complicated program into him than the complex uh, in, in instructions that are enshrined in the Ten Commandments. It's far more complicated. He's creating consciousness, creating human being. Because it seems... To, I was reading Milton's Paradise Lost when I was writing my book, and I was thinking that the one bit that... Because Milton goes on about it a lot. In, he's writing the same story. And Milton talks a lot about how the Archangel Gabriel, in his poem, teaches Adam and Eve the rules. But it's very important that they know the rules, because if they don't know the rules, how can you say they've sinned? by taking the apple and all that. So it's very important. And Michelangelo nowhere has Adam and Eve being told the rules, but he's got this finger, which is so different from the gestures of the past. And I think the finger is literally, and, and he's looking really intently, God, not at Adam, he's looking at his own finger. So it's as if God, his thought is going into the finger, and then the thought, God's consciousness becomes his finger, and his finger, shh, magically animates Adam with consciousness, but it's a kind of programming as well as creating act. So he's, he's forming his mind and forming him with rules that he will then break, which makes our fall all the more disgraceful and terrible because we have been programmed not to do that, but we've still done it. The interesting thing as well is that the, in, the finger never touches. So the, what I took from that, and perhaps you have a different point on this, is the fact that all that information isn't transferred. So it's not like as if all the knowledge of the divine is given to, to us. It's only like such a small subset. So we're never touching. We're just, we're so close, but we're never, we're never on the same level. Well, that's an interesting way of seeing it. I mean, I, 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 my feeling was, but it, again, it's, it's also in the same in the, in the old 
uh, older representations, God never touches Adam, I believe. There may be one, actually, there may be one image that I know where he, he's almost pulling him out of the ground. Um, so he is holding his hand. But I think that Michelangelo definitely doesn't want any physical contact between God and Adam because there can be no contact between the divine and the human, no physical contact. It's a spiritual connection um, and, and it exists at the level of, of the soul or the consciousness. It's not physical um, so, and, and it's also intellectual. Um, which is which is in line with Michelangelo was exposed to quite a lot of he, you know, he read quite a lot of Plato or at least Neoplatonism in in his Florentine years and he's he's clearly very much thinking throughout his life about about how the body relates to the soul and in a lot of his art it's almost as if he wants to create sculpted or drawn or painted bodies that are so spiritualized they have almost shed their material nature um, and have become idealized to the point where they represent the form of an idea. In, in reference to the actual individuals that are that are painted, one question I did have was, obviously we've talked about Michelangelo and his relationship with, with religion and his spirituality and his asceticism. And specifically in relation to the deluge, there's a lot of expressive nude figures. And... What I would have thought is someone who has such a ascetic nature or someone who's so religious would be somewhat apprehensive to draw nude figures in such a way. Uh, perhaps that's just um, a more contemporary view of, of religion. Perhaps they had a different view of it. What do you think about that drawing of, of individuals in a nude way in, in such a religious and sanctimonious place? Well, it's not only, it's not only um, in the deluge, but it's... Um, there's a whole register of figures called the Inudi, the nudes, which are these nude figures who serve no purpose in the story. They're placed in, in, in these decorative um, areas of the chapel throughout on both sides. And they, they decorate around. They're almost like part of a painted frame to the, to the main stories from Genesis, um, along with the prophets and the sibyls who do have a biblical function, but these Inudi don't. And um, they caused a great deal of controversy because they are naked, very beautiful. Um, and when a later Pope, Hadrian VI, came to the papacy, not that much later, he looked up at the chapel and he just referred to it as a bathroom full of nudes. Um, and a later initiative had Daniele de Volterra painting fig leaves onto all the genitalia of these figures, which have now many, 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 many years later been taken off. So the, the ceiling is unfig leafed. But so the nudity was controversial in Michelangelo's own time. But I, I, I think the context to understand it is in, in Michelangelo's mind, the idea that he could be immoral or, or lubricious or you know, erotically suggestive, was so crazy that who on earth could possibly suspect Michelangelo the ascetic of that? And, and as far as he was concerned, you know, I would come back to the, to the origins of the Sistine Chapel, which is that he has given the Sistine Chapel to paint as a consolation prize because he is a sculptor. He's been called to Rome because he's created the David, the world's most astonishing sculpture of a male nude by the way, but there's nothing sexy about it, um, not in my view. He wants to create this great tomb for Julius II, the Pope who will commission the Sistine Chapel from him, and he spends a year and a half or something of that nature up in Carrara with two men and a horse, you know, I mean, ridiculous situation, quarrying his own marble to create the largest ensemble of marble sculpture in the history of humankind. He brings these vast blocks of marble that he has personally quarried with these men, and these are huge things. He brings them all to Rome. They're lying in a piazza. The rain is on them, but they, you know, they, are, they occupy several football pitches, these blocks of marble. And the tomb itself is going to be larger than, a, than quite a large church. And it's going to be placed in old St. Peter's. And he's going to create this astonishing tomb to Julius II with all this marble. And suddenly Julius thinks, oh, maybe I shouldn't do this because this is a bit hubristic. I mean, after all a tomb to a pope that's the size of a football pitch. 
he may also have actually doubted Michelangelo's ability to do it because on the basis of the surviving figures that he did carve that were put up in a much smaller final version of that tomb which is in a church called San Pietro in Vincoli if you look at the original design that Michelangelo made and think well how long would it have taken him some people reckon it would have taken him a hundred years carving with the energy of a 20 year old to finish this tomb so the Pope may have thought he couldn't do it but all that by the by when Michelangelo discovers that the tomb's been cancelled and that the marble's all going to be used actually for a new church, a new cathedral, St Peter's, to be built by Bramante, he's so furious he runs off. Um, he runs off to a place called, um, what's it called? Poggi Bonsi, which is now um, one of the main <laughs> centres for acquiring flat pack furniture in Tuscany. He, <laughs> he runs off there and the Pope's agents finally catch up with him. He's in a sock and they say, well, tell you what, the, the Pope has said, um, y you can paint a chapel. You can paint the Sistine Chapel instead of the tomb. You know, we can't do the tomb. He doesn't want to do that, but you can do this chapel. And he remains in really annoyed. And eventually, after a few years, he comes around to it and does agree to do the Sistine Chapel. But for him, it's a consolation prize as a commission. And, and if you look at the Sistine Chapel as a thing, if you, if you imagine it as a three-dimensional thing, what is it? It's a painted version. The stories are all different. The iconography is all different. But it's a painted version of that huge sculpture that he'd originally wanted to make. So it's a painting that says, I want to be a sculpture. And I think that's what all these nudes are. You know, they turn the a lot of the, the deluge that you referred to at the beginning of your question. You know, it looks like a sarcophagus freeze. It's very classical. You know, it's it, it it's references are to sculpture, not to other paintings, and and that's and I think that's what's going on. Those in Nudi are really um, there is one little. They are actually the closest bit to the tomb um, because they are all of them surrounded and wreathed and garlanded with oak leaves. And Julius II's family name was Della Rovere, and Rovere is oak tree. So I think the Inudi are, are really just Michelangelo's say of way, way of saying this whole thing was commissioned by Giulio Della Rovere. This, these are the boys who symbolise him, as well as being a kind of ideal classical sculpture gallery. And so they're sort of, Julius wasn't clever enough to get me to do a sculpture for him, and I wanted to do a sculpture, but he did commission it. So that's why I put these boys here. That's what all the things that they're saying. It's like a consolation prize. It's like, I was meant to do this, I couldn't do it, so here they are. Yeah, and also IDing Julia and saying, you know, Julius, it was his idea. <laughs> I wanted to do a sculpture. So I've done a painting that looks like a sculpture. This, this is what happens when he and me met. I actually did want to talk uh, briefly about his, his approach to fresco painting, um, because like, as we've discussed and before he painted the Sistine Chapel, he was a sculptor by profession, sculpting David. And his approach to uh, painting frescoes was very much from, in the book you referenced, like 3D. So he liked to see a 2D. He saw 2D and everyone else saw 2D, but he sort of saw 3D and he painted in such a way. So how did his approach to fresco painting, inspired by his sculpting, how, how did that separate him from his peers and, and those that came after him? Well, I think he, sculpt, he, he sculpted very much, he painted, he, he did paint very much um, like a sculptor. Um, I mean, the crossover between painting and sculpture was much closer in those days than it is now, and, uh, uh, and, and indeed between architecture. You know, there were great architects who also painted and made sculptures. Um, and Donatello, for example, is credited with creating a sculptural frieze that is, in a sense, the very first painting in perspective to be made in Florence. It's a painting, but it's actually in the form of a sculpture. So there was a tradition within Florentine art. Um, and the thing that runs through it all, the thing that's most significant uh, and, and that Vasari goes on about a lot, is the idea of line, which is the thing that unites architecture, sculpture and um, fresco in Michelangelo's mind. It's what separates him from an artist, like the greatest artist from the opposite spectrum, which is Venice, where there's much less drawing, there's much less line. There's no fresco in Venice um, because of the weather and the dampness. So they have an oil painting tradition there, which doesn't require drawing in the same way. Whereas Michelangelo, for Michelangelo, I think the thing that unites everything is the idea. So in all, of, in all that he makes, What's central is the line. 
what's central is the form. And in his mind, the form can be three-dimensional, it can be two-dimensional, it can be whatever he wants it to be, because he does have an extraordinary ability to um, think spatially, but also in a linear way. So he can, he's, he's hugely adaptable in that sense. So he can use line almost in an abstract way, but he always knows how to make a form into a sculpture. So he's got a great advantage, and he and he knows how to model a form instinctively. So by the end of the Sistine Chapel, when he paints the very last, you know, it's an amazing fact that when he painted the deluge at the beginning of the four years of working, okay, the deluge is a large painting, and the creation, the separation of light and darkness is not so large a painting. But the deluge, nonetheless, and we know this from technical analysis, the, de the deluge took 32 days. And don't quote me exactly, I think it's 32 days. Uh, whereas the separation of light and darkness above the altar, the very last image probably that Michelangelo painted of the Sistine Chapel, there are no pounce marks, there's no drawing that we can see. If you x-ray it, there's no drawing underneath. It's painted freehand in fresco from his idea and he does it in one day. That's it. I mean, it's a huge thing. It's, it's like, you know, nine feet high. Six, but he does it in one day. And I remember years ago I met um, Hugo Chapman, who's the uh, director of the Prints and Drawings Mu um, Department of the British Museum. And he put on a very fascinating exhibition of drawings by Michelangelo. But there was, and I remember him taking me round and showing me some things. But there was one in particular, which was a drawing... It was an architectural drawing, and it was a drawing for um, a piece of entablature or um, the, the, the top of a column, which was um, quite a complicated form with leaves, but it went all the way around the column. And the drawing had three versions. It had front-on view, it had section, and it had cross-section. And he said, Hugo said, you know, this is impossible to do. You know, you can do it now with a computer. There are computer programs that can get... You can do a form and then you can do it in cross-section. You know, the computer program will work it out. But to do it freehand, perfectly, with, without, you know, just it's as if he's turning the form in his mind. And as he turns it in his mind, he can see exactly how it looks. He's got something in his brain that enables him completely to translate... Um, you know, this into that. It's as if he could, you know, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous that he could do that. And, and, and there's a similar but different story. As Vasari asked him, how do you create a figure like the, the David? You know, because not only did he have to carve the David freehand, I mean, but, but he also had to work around existing faults in this large block of marble that meant that the leg had to go there. And it had to, so he's really complicated just as the level of problem solving. And he said, how did you manage to create this figure? That, that just is, it, it's, he, he said, well, it's, for me, it, Michelangelo's answer to Vasari was, for me, the figure is always already there. And for me, carving a figure is like pulling a man out of a pool of water. So it just slips out and he comes out and that's it. He's pulling him out of water. It's, it's no more complicated than that. And you think of the tactics of later generations of sculptors like Canova with all their pointing devices and ways of translating small models into large sculptures. Michelangelo didn't use any of that. I think ultimately if you, if you pushed him on it, he'd say, he, he might take you back to that finger of God and say, well, it's actually, it's that finger of God. You know, I'm just a bit closer to that finger than any of you lot. So the information is a higher quality level. <laughs> So that's why I can do these things. Is that, is that the humility? Is that the humility of uh, Michelangelo coming through? It does translate into a kind of humility in the end, because because even if you're very very close to God, you still only if you're Michelangelo, you still only realise how far away from God you are. And as he goes on in his life, later on in his life, he deliberately forsakes the astonishing grace and beauty of his earlier style and creates much more difficult, troubled less perfect, if you like, forms, which perhaps um, do represent a kind of uh, turning away from his own younger hubris and, and perhaps an acknowledgement that perhaps as he gets older, he doesn't necessarily feel that he's as 
so much closer to that finger of God than the rest of us, as he does when he's painting the Sistine Chapel as a relatively young man. And there's a very moving series of drawings in the British Museum, which again were actually shown to me once by Hugo, um, in which he draws um, he draws Christ on the cross. And they're weird drawings. You can look them up online um, if, you, if you look up the crucifixion drawings that the British Museum own. And I think the Royal Collection owns a very beautiful one as well. And he goes over the form again and again and again and again, so that it becomes a kind of weird, almost like Cezanne might have drawn it. It's got many, many different outlines, so it becomes almost blurred. Um, and, and Hugo had a very interesting theory about that, that he, he says that the drawings are actually prayers, and that whereas um, an ordinary person might um, take a different bead of the rosary and move it round the bracelet of the rosary with each prayer, so they pray, they say a Hail Mary and then they move a bead, they say another Hail Mary and they maybe say 20 for the 20 beads on the rosary. Michelangelo says a Hail Mary and draws right the way around his crucifixion. Then he says another one and draws right the way around the crucifixion. And so you end up with this drawing that is a kind of materialised gesture of the act of praying. That's a very interesting theory. I love that. It sounds, it sounds great. I love that. You started off the book with this um, with this quote. You said Michelangelo didn't just invent invent a new kind of art, but a new idea of what art could be. So I think it'd be great just to finish, Andrew, to talk about what the legacy of uh, Michelangelo was, and the Sistine Chapel in, in general, and and what impact he had on on art, or what art could be. Well, I think one of the things that was interesting about the restoration of the Sistine Chapel when it happened in the 1980s and, and, and the centuries of candle smoke um, were removed from the surface of the frescoes was the sheer vibrancy of the colours, particularly of the later parts of the chapel. Um, and, that, and that vibrancy of colour suddenly made apparent to everyone um, who's interested in Renaissance and High Renaissance and later art, just how much, as a colourist, which is not his reputation in art history, it's not his reputation, he's, a, he's known as the man of line, not the man of colour, but how revolutionary his use of colour was. These sort of clashing, astonishing yellows and reds and scarlets and lime greens. And suddenly one could see how deeply influenced the troubled generation, troubled by the Reformation and, and the upheavals in the church that occurred not long after the creation of the Sistine Chapel, the extent to which that sense of clashing colour and form and straining action and, and unease that, that's there in the Sistine Chapel, how much that would be taken forward by the great artists of the Mannerist period, as it's known. Um, for example, Pontormo who for me is one of the greatest artists who ever lived and whose work survives only in a few examples because his main work, San Lorenzo in Florence, was destroyed by fire. But he's, if you go, for example, to Santa Felicita, one of the most amazing um, depositions in the history of art, it's, it's as if the spirit of the Sistine Chapel permeates that work. And you think of Rosso Fiorentino working for Louis the, um, Francis I, in Fontainebleau, who's deeply under the sway of Michelangelo, and just a generation of generation of artists. But I think his, his greatest influence is, is through just the sheer magnitude of the achievement of the Sistine Chapel, the sheer uh, scale and ambition of it. And so, so somebody like Vasari is emboldened to write The Lives of the Artists, which is a book in many ways ahead of its time because um, throughout large swathes of Europe, artists are still regarded in the courts and the royal households where they paint mostly, and indeed by the churches for whom they, they paint. They're regarded as craftsmen. They're not regarded as the equals of, you know, painting is still not one of the seven liberal arts, as Leonardo da Vinci in outrage comments again and again in his notebooks. Painting is seen as a low form of expression, and so likewise sculpture, maybe sculpture even lower because it's more handicraft, it's more like a builder doing his thing. And um, I think Michelangelo is the artist, above all other artists, who changes that. Vasari's book is the, is the book 
that begins the change whereby people begin to see artists as among the most important expressors of human truth, um, along with philosophers and poets um, and indeed great scientists. Uh, and Vasari's book sets the, the seal on that. And, and from Vasari's book stems that great tradition of starting academies of, of artists. So artists suddenly have academies, like musicians who, who had long been regarded as part of the liberal arts because music was connected with mathematics and mathematics had a high intellectual reputation. So musicians were higher than artists, but not anymore, and not after Michelangelo. And I think Michelangelo was the one who effected that sea change and made the writing of Vasari's book possible, made the foundation of European academies possible. Basically, I mean, without him, I don't think that change would have happened when it happened. And, and he made it impossible not to think of an artist like that. I mean, you cannot go into the Sistine Chapel and think, oh, you've had the decorators in. You know, I mean, this is, this is, this is, more, this is more than the builders coming in. Although there was a, there was a minimalist artist, <laughs> there was a minimalist artist um, called I, I, uh, I can't remember his name, but one of the great American minimalists, it may have been Sol LeWitt, um, went in and looked up at the Sistine Chapel. And you know the minimal artists; they only made like base bare forms, so they would be like Donald Judd's cubes of pure steel or a painting that's just pure white. And the, this American minimalist went in and he looked up at the Sistine Chapel and he said, ah, oh, well, if it had been me, I would have used a roller and done it in a week. <laughs> but other than that, the artistic response to the Sistine Chapel, the artistic response to the Sistine Chapel, other than that, has been nothing short of, you know, awe and bewilderment and amazement. And, and if you're think, thinking about, you know, the tradition of art in Britain, you know, who founds the Royal Academy? Joshua Reynolds. So without him, there would be no academy in Britain. What was Joshua Reynolds, mo what, which work of art in the whole world did he hold in high regard more than any other? The Sistine Chapel. In the, you know, he, he even said in, in one of his discourses, I think at the end of his very last discourse, he says, because I would only wish as an artist, if I could have my time again, to step in his trail, to follow in his footsteps, I wish that the very last word I say in these discourses that he's been giving for 16 years at the Royal Academy, the very last word I say shall be his name, and that name is Michelangelo. So, you know, he, 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 what he did to the perception of what artists could do. And in the, and in the 18th century, it was such, such was his reputation that in the 18th century, you know, when they weren't electing a pope or holding a mass, they actually allowed the leading artists of Europe, who were mostly studying in Rome when they were young, that's where they would all study, all of the artists, at least 50 or 60, they each had their own bed in the Sistine Chapel. And they were allowed every day to go in and they would lie on their bed and they would look up at the Sistine Chapel and absorb it and breathe it in. All the artists of Germany, all the artists of France, all the artists of England, all the artists of Scandinavia, they would, they would sort of sunbathe underneath Sistine Chapel in the hope that somehow, you know, that the finger that, that, that had given Michelangelo the inspiration, that had created Adam, that the finger would somehow infuse them with the ability to be great artists. So no wonder you look at the Pre-Raphaelites, you look at the Nazarenes, you look at the German, you look at somebody like Jericho, um, who painted the Raft of the Medusa, which is, among other things, a great homage to Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel and the Last Judgment. You know, the influence is just enormous. And then it goes forward into the, into the comic books of, 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 of the... Of the of the 1950s and the 1960s, the invention of creatures like like Batman. Believe it or not, you know the artists who created Batman were profoundly influenced by by the Sistine Chapel and those flying figures and that idea of energy. You know, Batman and Spider Man. They're highly mannerist creations. So you know, it's it, you you can't really end where his influence ends because it's still. Going I think it, for me, when I when I read it back and I read this book specifically, it felt like a watershed moment in history for art because art, the art world or artists weren't seen in the same way after the Sistine Chapel was created. It's a new realm or a new podium for artists or what artists could be and their and their place in society. So 
yeah that those those sentiments is that you you put it so wonderfully so we, we've come to our, the end of our time andrew I, I once again i really appreciate you coming back on and and discussing uh, michelangelo and the sistine chapel from from your book um where's the best place to everyone to to find you and, and get and and find out more about you and and your work Oh, well, um, if anyone's interested, come to my website, andrewgrahamdixon.com. Um, join the website. I, I give a Wednesday uh, evening talk most Wednesdays. Um, and there's about 100, 100 and more, maybe 150 films um, that you can have access to on there and about 2,000 written articles about all aspects of art. I do Q&As. Um, we have all sorts of events and we do make little films about exhibitions that are happening uh, so it's kind of like it began as a website and it's become a kind of tv channel um and and archival resource so um yeah please come along and um you know it's it i, I believe it's not too expensive to, to 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 join um you get most benefit if you are a member i think it's 15 or 20 pounds a year i can't remember exactly but um uh, and there are concessions as well. So, yeah, it'd be lovely to see you. The more you come, the more we can do. Definitely. I definitely recommend your documentaries as well, because I know the one on Caravaggio is one that inspired me to find out more about you that I found out on, on BBC, I think it was. Um, so definitely recommend the documentaries. I'm actually currently listening, uh, watching the one that you're doing on the Medici, the Medici family, because it seems to be a thread oh, right. throughout um, Renaissance art in Italy. And I want to find out more about the Medici. Cause I think you did a series on, on the Medici family. So I'm, I'm currently watching that one. So, um, cool. I'm on, yeah, I'm on part good. two. <laughs> yeah, no, a lot of the documentaries, are, I've made so many documentaries that I, I actually want, I made the website partly, well, originally mostly so that I could actually have access to my own material through one website. So I was the main user. So it meant I could watch any of the hundred or 120 docs, but you know, at the click of a button. Um, so, so that was one of the reasons to do the website, funnily enough, was just to get them together because they're so dispersed and you can find them sometimes on YouTube, but then the next time you go, you can't find them. So I thought, well, at least if I put them in one place. So that's, um, that's part of it. But we sort of grown in a slightly different direction now. So it's more uh, interactive and we, you know, we do talks on things that people want to do and, you know, want to hear about and, and so on, but, um, can't really describe it. And, uh, you know, you have to come along and, and, and sort of join in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely recommend checking out the website because I know you do trips as well. Sometimes, obviously, we ha you haven't probably done any trips in the past year or two, but um, I know if anyone's interested, they can they can sign up to that as well. So, anyway, Andrew, it's been a pleasure again. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me, and thank you for asking such uh, interesting questions.